Welcome. Today we're going to attempt to install a two-post advantage lift. I shouldn't say attempt, we are going to install a two-post advantage lift. And if you're watching this video, most likely you've already purchased one and are waiting for delivery. Or you're thinking about purchasing one and you want to see if it's something you possibly want to install yourself or have one of our service techs come and install for you. So to start out, um, there's a list of tools you're going to need. And this might help determine whether or not you want to install it yourself. On this workbench here, I have an assortment of metric wrenches. This assortment goes from 9mm to 24mm. 3 8 half inch drive ratchet, a metric Allen wrench set, a set of tin snips, a pair of vice grips, a ratcheting screwdriver with a straight end, um, Phillips blade in it, some zip ties, shop rags, chalk line, utility knife, blow gun, different metric sockets. These are 3 8 drive and these are half inch drive. This is a 40 ounce dead low hammer. We'll use this to drive the anchors in. You can use a mini sledge if you want. Um, these are very gentle on your hands. Pry bar, some grease, a funnel, some work gloves, channel lock, the all essential adjustable wrench. We have a little paintbrush here that we're going to use to grease the inside of the columns, magic marker, and now to the essentials. We have a half inch torque wrench. Our anchors will be torqued to the floor when they're done. That's an ALI specification. And then this is the tool you may not have, but it's important. This is a Hitachi inch and nine sixteenth rotary hammer. This is what we're going to drill our holes with. You don't have to have an Atachi. There's many good brands in there. DeWalt has them. Um, um, Milwaukee has them. So whatever you have, but you don't want to use a small hammer drill. You want a rotary hammer. If you don't have one, everybody rents them. And what bit you're going to need is a good three-quarter inch bit. This happens to be a spline. And you want to make sure your bit has good teeth on it because if it's wore out, the hole isn't going to be big enough to put your anchors in. And that's going to cause problems. Okay, then we go on. There's a 25 foot tape measure. This is just an assortment of snap ring pliers. This is a half inch battery operated impact gun. We have our updated instruction manual. The lift you're going to get will have an outdated manual in it. Make sure you request that they send you one. I was told that everybody who buys a lift from now on will get this updated one. And then you'll need an extension cord, a good heavy cord. I like a little three-way adapter with mine so I can run my drill and the shop vac at the same time. I um, have a couple knee pads. Um, we have a magnetic four-foot level and we'll have a shop bag and if you're going to use a vacuum to clean the dust make sure it's one that has a bag inside because without that bag after a couple holes your dust is going to literally just blow out the exhaust I have an electric test wire for when we get done so we can run a wire to run the lift. And I have a personal boxer that has miscellaneous electrical um, connectors in it, wire strippers, just in order to be able to hook up our test wire. On site, if we do the installation, we will run a test to the lift so we can run, lead, and adjust. But at the end, we will disconnect that. It will be up to you as a customer to either install the final wiring yourself or have someone come in and do it. Okay, now we've got the lift we're going to install. We're going to install our Advantage AL-10SC. And what this lift is, is, is the Advantage lift, 10,000 pounds, clear floor. That means all the cables and hoses are going to run overhead, and when you drive through this lift, there's nothing in the floor in the way. And we can do that because of the height we have in this building. This building is 21 feet to the peak, 14 foot to the walls, and we need 12 feet only to install this lift. 
So that's an important factor when you're deciding what lift you need. Make sure if you're getting this lift, you have the 12 feet needed to install. Oh, by the way, this is my helper for the day, Lashar. He's going to help me put this up together, disassemble it. Um, so, now, before we disassemble it, what you can do is go get the, the utility knife and the strap cutters meanwhile. You want to inspect your lift. When you take the livery of the lift and you pick it up at a hub, you're most likely going to go up there with your car trailer. They're going to load it onto your car trailer and you're going to get it back. Now, first of all, you've got to get it off the car trailer. If you're fortunate enough to have a forklift, the end is set up to put your forks in. And then what we do to protect the lift, we put a board on the tip of the forks. And when you pick this up, then you can drive it right off your car trailer, right in to where you want to install. If you don't have a car or a lift, forklift to unload your lift, then the best way to get it off is to watch our four post video, our four post advantage video, and there's a complete detail of how to use um, a car dolly and an engine crane, and you can easily take this off the back of your trailer, easily and safely. Because this, I'm not going to go through all that, because just watch our four post advantage video, and it'll show you in detail how to remove this off a car trailer. With all you need is an engine crane, chain, and a wheel dolly. Okay? So, but now you take the livery. But before you take it off, or allow them to load it on, inspect the lift. We package it, we wrap, we bubble wrap, we stretch wrap, we put cardboard on. And what we do that for is to protect the lift. So when you get your lift, it's not damaged. When it left our warehouse, it was not damaged. Because the freight company inspects it, and they have to sign for it that it's not damaged. Well, they're expecting you to sign for it that it's not damaged. If you don't check out the lift and sign for it, open it up and find damage, that freight company's not going to do anything for you. You signed for it that it wasn't damaged. Now it's your damage. And then you're going to call us, and then we're going to have this, why'd you sign for it, not inspect it. So all you do is go around it, look very closely. If you see any fork marks here, then you better, better look real close for damage that they did when they picked up against there. If you see any of this ripped off, uh, what we run into is the forklifts, when they put it on the truck, will run along here and tear this whole cardboard off, and the wheel will scratch the paint down the length of the lift. It's a simple inspection. Walk around and look for anything out of normal. You look at this lift, it looks perfect, because this one we loaded and unloaded here from our own warehouse. If you suspect anything, just tell your driver. I want to put down on my receipt possible damage until further inspection because he's not going to want you to unpack this whole thing. But if you see something questionable and you look, and they'll mark that down. They'll, they'll write that on your receipt. And once you sign that, now you have an out that if there is any further damage that you see that you didn't see at first, then you can go back to the trucking company and they'll take care of it. Okay, so it's important. Inspect your lift before you sign for it. Okay, Lashard, if you want to start. Now what Lashard is going to do is remove all our plastic. He's going to be careful not to cut any hoses, any paint. here hold the overhead piece on so we're going to each grab an end and he's going to cut the strap I got this end now he'll get that end and cut that strap one more right here that hidden one they really take care of the packaging these lifts so they don't get damaged in movement Take it, 
Again, this is the overhead. Okay, now the shard got us all unpackaged. You can see our lift. You can inspect it again. There are no nicks, cuts, scratches. And that's the way you should get it. That's the way your lift should arrive. So if you pre-inspect it before you sign for it, this is the way your lift will end up. Now the shard dug out our parts box. This was packaged in between here. This has all the nuts, bolts, anchors, hoses, cables and pins, and brackets to assemble this lift. Also in this parts box is going to be the manual. Now this is the older manual, the original one, that probably is going to come in your parts box. And if you look, all the dimensions are in millimeters. So the shard has the updated one we had talked earlier about, where it has been converted to inches and fractions. So when you lay out your lift, it's going to be a lot easier to look at the new one instead of trying to convert this. So that's one of the reasons we made an updated one to help you out in your installation. Okay? Now, Lashawn, what we'll do is we'll move this out of the way, we'll set it out of our way, and then we're going to start picking out the arms, all the parts. Got that? Okay, now that the parts box is out of the way, our arms are packaged inside the column. So before we try to remove this column, we're going to make it, we want to make it as light as possible. So we're going to pull our arms out. Let's grab that one. And we're going to set them over here out of the way. And if you look close in here, if I can pull Unique up, you can see that the columns are already pre-routed. The hoses is in here, and the cables are in here. Pre-routed. The hydraulic cylinders in here and mounted. The carriage is mounted. So a lot of your installation is already done. It's just a matter of once you get it stand up, finish hooking things up. Okay, now we need to remove this top column and get it down on the floor so we can stand it up. There's a couple ways you can do it. Um, myself, in my days, I used to put tires on the ground and just roll it over onto the tires. That way both posts would be on the ground so you can unbolt it. You don't have physical lifting of the weight of this. But in this video, we're going to use an engine crane. And we're going to strap the center of it, try to find our center of gravity. And we're going to actually use an engine hoist, which most likely if you unloaded it off your trailer, you're going to have one handy along with the strap to pick this off use the engine hoist to bring it back and get it down on the ground where we can handle it. Okay, <clears throat> now we got our engine hoist out and we have a strap, <clears throat> excuse me, that we've wrapped around a few times to take up the slack, but this strap protects the paint, or the powder coating I should say, from being scratched. And we're gonna use the engine hoist to literally pick the top one off, bring it back away from that, the bottom one and get it down to the ground where we can handle it safely where we're not going to get our fingers pinched. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jack up on this, get some tension on the strap, and then I'll have the shard take the wrenches and the impact gun and literally go ahead. I think we got enough tension on there that Now when I went underneath there, I had to be careful I didn't hit the lock assembly. On the back of your columns, there's a latch assembly. This is actually your carriage lock. You don't want to be running your legs into that. And this is another thing, you got to be careful. If there's fork marks inside that cardboard, they may have hit this and damaged it. So if you see any kind of damage, again, when you take delivery of it, tear it off, inspect it, and write it up if there's any visual damage. Okay. All the bolts you use to assemble this lift have come inside that parts box.
I got the bolts out of there, is it? Post free. We'll raise up on it. Machado will balance it in case we're a little bit off center. It actually looks like we got it pretty close. You okay? Yep. Okay, now I'm going to pull straight back. some wood down there so we don't scratch. I want to get be able to get the engine hoist out from underneath. Person is fine. If you have equipment, that's fine. We normally just stand them up by hand. You want to go side by side? Ready? Side by side. Yeah, because we're the same height. only on one post and this is, would be the power unit so now we got to determine where we want to put our power unit let's wrap some rags around that strip a little bit of oil out of there it has some residual oil in it from testing so that's our power unit column what we'll do is we'll get the other one unpackaged get it stood up then we'll go over the layout of the lift okay the hardest part of the job's over we got the this unstack, we got the column stood up. Now it should be all downhill from here. So now we need to talk about where we're going to put this lift in our garage. You may have already 
thought about that, but on a lift like this, which is a symmetrical lift, they recommend 13 feet from the garage door and 11 feet from nearest obstruction in the front, or minimum 12 and 12. So it just depends what you're going to be picking up. Now, fortunately, here in this garage, we have plenty of room. It's 40 foot deep. So we're going to keep it forward because we want to sneak a car in past the lift over into this other bay. So I'm going to go with the 11 feet from nearest obstruction, which if you look up front here, we have a workbench where the vise sticks out. So I'm literally going to go from the tip of this vise back, back 11 feet. And that's where we're going to put a chalk line. That's going to be the center line of our lift. And that should give us plenty of room. That'll give us at least three to four foot of workspace in front of the vehicle. Okay, now we've got our measurement of 11 feet from our nearest obstruction. So what we're going to do is we're going to put two lines at that distance and put a chalk line. That'll be our straight edge. So to make the lines, I'm going to go up this joint here that I cut in the floor. It's 26 inches back. Now I know this joint square to the wall because I marked it and I cut it myself. And let's talk about that just a little bit. If you're building a garage, and you're planning on putting a two-post lift in and it needs anchored, you're going to want to watch where they saw cut your floor. Because a lot of times, if you only have that specific 24 feet, 13 in the back, 11 up front, you don't want that joint right in the middle of your lift. You need to have that planned out ahead. Talk to your concrete guy. Have him separate the saw cuts. He's going to want to put saw cuts in there, which is fine, but he doesn't have to put them right where your lift is because you don't want any of your anchors within six inches of any saw cut or crack in the floor. Like you look at this floor, there's a crack had worked its way between here. That Because these are wedge anchors, and the wedge anchors are going to try and push that out. And if it has a crack, it can theoretically push that crack closed and weaken up your anchor. Okay? So that's something to think about. Now, if your garage is already built, you're going to have to work with what you got. But if it's something new, consider where the, the joints are. Have your lift laid out and have the joints cut accordingly. Now we're gonna get two marks. I'm at 26. I'm gonna go back here, go off this at 26. You wanna mark one down there at 26 and then we'll shoot a chalk line. I'm going to want to go a couple feet, feet past that because the lift's going to set more back where you should end it. Okay? The marks are down. See, I'm, I'm going to be on the mark. There we go. Go back a little further. That's good right there. And I'll go to here. You on? Yep. Okay. Just. Go. Okay, now we have the center line of the lift. We have our distance determined front to back. Now we need to know where on this line we want to center our lift. Now that this pallet racking had been moved off this wall, we can center it in our door. The old lift that you see that was in here was offset. Again, we want to move the lift over to try and open up the bay over here. What we're going to do is figure where the center of our door is. So we'll go down here. This is a 12 foot door. So, if I move to the wall, to the one edge, which is like Three and a half feet. So I add six to that. So six and a half feet to put up the center of this door. So we're going to come off of this wall six and a half feet. And we'll get the center line or lift. Well, nine and a half, sorry. It would be three and a half plus six, nine and a half. So is that about on the, the big rib? The big, the big room was there. Yep. Okay. So nine and a half feet.
and set it on our door. Yep, we're done with the chalk. Okay, now, the new manual. The new manual has our dimensions. It'll actually give us the outside dimensions of where we're supposed to set the lift up in inches. So LaShawn's going to look up that number for us. I think it's like 135 and a half. 134. Okay. Yep, outside to outside. 134 and 7 eighths. So roughly 135, which what's happened 135? Would be 67 and a half. Okay, here you go. You want to put a mark at the back end of that. Okay, hold that right there. Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually pull this out 134 and 7 eighths mm -hmm. so we have our exact number. take a measurement how long the base plate is. This base plate is 16 inches. So what I'll do is I'll measure up 16 inches. And because it's just a chalk line that has a tendency to disappear, I'll put another mark on the floor with a magic marker. So if it, even if it gets walked on, I have a reference point. Sixteen inches up. That should be the front of the plate there, so I usually go an inch either side of it. Yeah, from like there. No, back this way. All the way through it. There you go, that's good. Okay, take a close up of this, you need. This will be the back of our base plate. This will be the front. And this will be the center of that base plate. So because the chalk line easily gets wiped away, we do it a magic marker. So when we walk the lift over on top of it, we don't lose our, our settings. So now, you want to walk that one over? I'll walk this one over. And while we're, while we're doing this, um, we put the power unit on this side. Now that's a choice. You can go either side. This lift doesn't know right from left. The power unit could be on the driver's side or it could be on the passenger side. The preferred spot is the passenger side and I'll tell you why. When you drive in, you get out of the driver's side, you set your arms. Now you have to walk all the way around the vehicle to the passenger side and set your arms. Well, at this point, your power unit's right here. You can push the button and start to go up to check that you're uh, mounted correctly. If it's over there, then you gotta walk back around the vehicle. Same way, you're done with the vehicle, you lower it down onto the ground, you kick your arms out, you walk around it, you kick your arms out. Now your door's right here to get in the vehicle and drive out. It saves you a trip around the vehicle every, every one you do if the power unit's on the right. But you may be up against the wall. Here we have plenty of room. <clears throat> but if this is a tight fit where the wall's close and the power unit sticks out the back another 12 inches, you may not want it here so you can get by it. That'd be a good reason to put it over on the other side. The choice is yours. Just think about it. If it doesn't matter, the passenger side's the 
preferred side. Okay, we're gonna walk these into place. Okay, so let's start with this one. careful because it's not anchored yet. I like to stand on the base plate, get a guy on each side, and we can pick up on this. Is it clicking? And we actually went to the second lock, but that's fine too. So now it's actually locked in with the mechanical locks that you actually set it on to work on the vehicle. Now we can see our front to get our center better. We'll do the same to this side. Okay, at this point, we're going to finalize our centering of our lifts on our line because we want them square to each other. And then we're going to start anchoring. Okay, we got our lift set up according to the specs for the manual. And the way we did it is if you need to come up here close, we actually marked the floor with magic marker on our center line. And then we marked the center of the column. So this one could be huge just a little bit there. This center of the column is marked up with the center line of the chalk. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's the line mark in the back. It's, it's a black magic marker line real close to the back of this. Because the outside measurement, we, we put that on the floor too. So that keeps our distance correct. Then we do the same thing up front. We have a mark on the center line. And we want to line that up. with the center line of the floor. That keeps both columns straight facing each other. Square. Okay, and this one's the same. Now, the next step would be to start the anchoring. The shards get in the anchors together. What we use is three quarter inch wedge anchors. I think what are they, six inches long? Five and three quarters? These are six inches long. So the floor requirements for this lift is four and a quarter inches minimum in order to get full embedment of your anchor. If your floor is only three inches, that just makes this wedge part that actually holds it in closer to the top of the floor, which it could pull away. Now, if you have more than four and a quarter inches, that's fine. I know for a fact this floor here is at minimum five and a half inches. So we're going to be fine once we drill this out. Now in drilling, I drill all the way through the floor. The reason I do that is if you look here where the other lift was, when I wanted to remove it, I was able to drive the anchors into the floor. You're never going to pull them out. Well, if you drill, drill through the floor, you're not going to be able to do that. Then it's a matter of saw cutting, torching, or whatever to get them off. But it makes it a lot cleaner. I could actually drive them all the way down into the stone and put some grout in those holes to give it a nice finish again. So just plan on drilling through the floor. That's another reason why you have a good drill and a good bit. It doesn't take long. Okay. Um, now, there's five holes that mount this column. So which one do you drill first? Uh, a little bit of a trick is I put my level on here and I look to see which way the post is leaning. Okay, if you look at the level, this post is leaning towards the front. So it's going to have to go that way. Now, I'm going to put it on the back. 
and it looks like it has to go forward also. So it's got to go that way and forward. So my first anchor is, I'm going to put in is this one up here. And I can put it in, tighten it down because I know there's never going to be any shims underneath it. All the shims are going to be under the other ones in order to level this up. Okay, so that's how I determine which, which hole to drill first. So I'll drill that, I'll put an anchor in, I'll snug it up. That way when we drill the rest of it, if the drill bit hits our base plate, it doesn't move it and knock us off center. Okay? So I'll drill this first one. We'll fire that vacuum up. I like to run the vacuum the same time I'm drilling because it sucks the air out of the vacuum. Okay. Okay, now that we've drilled our first hole, it pretty much took what? 25, 30 seconds? That's why you get a good drill. And it does a nice clean hole. The vacuum sucked the dirt out. After I was done drilling, the shard stuck the vacuum over the hole, sucked all the dust out. Um, what I didn't mention to you that I should have mentioned is we talked about the joints. Well, you don't want your joints near any of your anchors. Well, also, you don't want any cracks near your anchors. And again, what you're looking for is to stay about six inches away um, from any joint or crack with an anchor. Uh, we're plenty far away because our nearest crack is like 29 inches and our nearest joint is 18 inches. Okay, so now you can talk about these holes. Well, how far away do you have to start from an, stay away from an existing hole? Well, if the hole is filled and it's not a hollow hole, you can be within two inches of that. Okay? Hopefully when you get your lift and put it in, it goes in where you want it and you never have to move it. Okay, the way the anchors work, I back the nut all the way up to the end. What I call flush nutting it. And you just drive it in. I leave the lock washers off. Because we had plenty of concrete. See how that drove down? If that, if that bit was too small, you'd have been beaten hard on that. It should take an effort to drive it down. It should be a tight fit, but you should easily be able to drive it in with a regular hammer. Okay, now because this is our first one, and before I drill the rest, I like to snug up on this. Now I got an inch and an eighth socket on an impact gun, but I'm not gonna tighten it with this. All I'm using this for is speed. Instead of sitting here going quarter turn with a ratchet, I'm gonna feather. That gives your wedge a chance to see. If you just get on there and score this thing, you could literally pull that up further than it needs to come up till it gets tight. So again, you can use an impact gun, but you gotta know how to use it. We don't use the impact gun for final tight. We're really just using it for an efficiency. Because as we shim this, we can be taking these or nuts on and off a couple times until we get it leveled up. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is let the shard drill the rest of these. We'll get this one plumbed and level, we'll go to the other one, and then we'll be back. Okay, Lashar got all the holes drilled, and he's put in the other four anchors. You'll notice he kept them up about an inch, because we're going to have to shim underneath them anchors, because our original level showed that we needed to lean forward and towards the garage door. So, now we're going to shim and level this lip. Now, based on this, I'm pretty close to being perfectly level, front to back. And I'm not hateful this way either. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna put one shim in here because there's a gap there and that was from our other anchor pushing forward. And I'll put one in here too. Any place one fits, if we're close, I'll put one in. That one's not gonna fit, that one's not gonna fit. So at this point where I put the two shims, I'm going to continue to fish drawing up the anchors. What you don't want to do is drive your anchors down and then realize you got to put 
like sometimes four shims underneath there, five shims because your floor slopes out the door, then you run out of threads. So the idea of leaving it up is so you get your shims in first before you draw them up. Now again, I'm going to just use the gun. like it's leaning back a hair which is the preferred way to lean because with weight on it the tendency is for it to want to roll in um, front to back it's dead on we're dead on perfect right in the center of the bubble can't make it any better than that this way like I said it's leaning back just a hair so what I'm going to try to do since this is your shims are a sixteenth inch. We don't have any thinner. I'm going to try and force one in here. Loosen these up and this is where you can use the gun. Now, um, can you pull that that way or maybe, maybe, maybe not. Let's get that pry bar, that green hammer pry bar up there on the workbench. I like this pry bar because it has a shank all the way through it. So when it's a tight fit, I can put it a little away. There it is. Let's see what that does. and we'll get a final reading because you really can't take a permanent reading until you have all your anchors snug. pulled up probably about 50 foot pounds of torque because we're going to do our final torque which is a hundred we'll do that with the torque wrench okay we're still you know, leaning back a hair but I think I'm going to leave it like that just because it deflects it's going to want to try to flex it my front to back again is dead on so if I were to put a whole nother shin in the back here, it may have it prefer leaning forward within the lines, but I prefer it if it's going to favor anyway, favor leaning back. So we're going to leave that one go. Um, now the next step would be to anchor this one. But before I anchor this one, I like to put my overhead on because the measurements, they're usually right on. But the top piece actually is going to determine it because there's no adjustment in that. Once it's on and anchored, then we'll check this with our level. And we may have to shift on or off that line a quarter of an inch. But if you anchor it now, then it's going to be a tight fit up there trying to get your overhead on. So at this point, my next step would be to put the overhead on. Okay, what we're getting ready to do is put our overhead piece on. Like we said, we want to put it on, get the bolts in before we permanently mount our second column so we make sure our distances are correct well before we can put it up we have to mount our overhead switch and that's what Lachard's working on here uh, what he has in his hand is a switch that goes overhead and if anything were to hit it show him how it opens it disconnects your continuity and will shut the power unit off and this will be connected to a power padded bar on the overhead and it's a safety switch it's designed that you protect the lift and protect the vehicle if you have a tall vehicle. So you can see, if you can see close, there's two wires and they're connected to the two outside terminals, which is what 
the bar is connected to the outside terminal so it stops the flow of electricity through there if anything hits that switch. Now what he's going to do is mount that switch to a bracket that then gets mounted to the overhead. So he's going to put the cover back on, mount it to the bracket, then the bracket will get mounted to the overhead bar. In the meantime, we, what we did, we sorted out all our nuts and bolts so we had everything organized to where everything went. Now, if you notice, too, the wires were very small going to this overhead switch, so it's a control wire. You're not going to want to run your 240 through this wire. It's actually going to be hooked up inside the power unit to the switch. So all it does is works the contactor, and then your power, your high voltage, actually is going to go through the contactor. And that will be your 20 amp wire. Now notice when he puts this on here, he's putting the push button at the slot because that's where your padded bar goes through that. And that will be easier to explain once we actually mount it to the overhead switch. Or the overhead bar, sorry. You have all the tools you need there? I do. And I mentioned it here while he's putting this together. Before you start installing your lift, you should read thoroughly through the instructions, and it'll go into detail on some of this small, intricate hookups. There's very small screws that hold this together because there's really no pressure. That switch opens up very easily and as soon as the bar is hit, it will open that switch and it'll stop the vehicle from going up because it actually shuts the motor off, the power unit. Okay. Okay, we'll put together the overhead switch to our overhead. We brought out a drum so we didn't have to work on the floor and our workbench is too full, so we put a pad on again to protect the powder coating. You need to connecting the brackets. And um, when he's done connecting these, there's jam nuts that go on the inside, so for vibration you don't want these to come loose. So they're going to come in the kit, even though this is drilled and tapped, you want to put the jam nuts on the back side because the, the vibration could work them loose and you won't know it until the whole assembly power padded bar falls down, hits something. So as soon as he's done with that, you got them all tight? Okay, now we'll turn it over. There's enough room on this inside now to put a lock washer and a jam nut. Now we pick the side where 
the power unit's going to be to put our switch. We decided that our power unit's going to be on the passenger side, so we put the switch on the passenger side because this cable here is going to eventually go down into the power unit. All the brackets are tight. Now the last thing we have to do is just install the actual padded bar, the part that actually gets engaged. Vehicle goes up. Now one end's going to have threads. That's the end that mounts it. The other end just floats. Okay, now because this has to float, we'll put a bolt through and then we have a jam nut. It needs to rock. Turn this in, then actually take the jam nut, jam it against the rod. Now, go ahead and work it. If we were just to tighten this tight against there and put it against here, it may take more effort and could possibly bend the rod. So that's why you get the jam nut and the nut to allow yourself a little play at this end for it to pivot. Okay, I think the next step is, hold on, I'm gonna jam that little tighter. You got one in? I do. Okay, because I gotta pull this towards me a little bit. Uh, let me, you want me to get the other one in? Yeah, get the other one in and then you can actually go down and then lean it towards me. Can we put the boat on for now or no? I just drop, just, yeah, just drop them down through. So let's get our level and see where we're at. Right here over there. Front to back, we're very close. In to out, looks like we're very close, but it looks like our base could go in a little bit. Hit a block of wood, I'll tap it. It's not going to be much. I got it, You get it? Okay, that's pretty good. Granted, our lines are very close. We're, we're less than a quarter inch off our mark. And this way, right now, we're, we're plumb. If we can just anchor it at this point, I'd be a happy camper. So. Drill a hole. And square up front. Front 
Again, we're making sure we stay on our, our center line. We're square. Tight enough now that the rest of the anchors can be drilled and tightened up. And then we can tighten everything up and do our final assembly. Okay, we got our second column anchor and level. So the next step is to start wrapping our hoses and cables for overhead. Shell speeding the hose through me. Now remember when this was down, there were some eyelets up here. They were welded to the center of the overhead piece. The hose is working that through that. That's a guide to keep the hose in the center of the overhead piece to keep it from running the cables when the cables operate. So as this lift's been operated, these cables are going to be moving through this lift. You know, I don't know where I'm at. Okay, I got it. Is this, some, is this my next eyelet? I can't see. Yep. Okay. I'm going to feed you some more. I just don't want to miss it. I'm not up high enough to be able to see. Oh, I got another eyelet right here at the end? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now. So you, you're through the hole in the center of your bracket? Okay, I need just some more. You can keep feeding it to me. There you go. There you go. I'm, I'm out the back of the bracket. Now I'm about to bend down. Go down the column. Okay. Feeding it. Okay, hold up there. Now we get through the overhead piece, through all the eyelets. In this column, there's also a guide welded to the back. Can you see that? Be hard to see, but it's right here. So as it's going down, the hose has to go inside that, and again, that protects it from any movement that goes on when the lift's going up and down. Okay. Any more? Yep. Yeah, I'm going to need everything you've got in there. 
this has to go all the way to the bottom. I guess I should have showed you this earlier, but it's a banjo type fitting. You might be more familiar with this as, as hooking up brake hoses on calipers and rotors. And what it is is the nut and washers that seal it are on the end of the cylinder. So we just need to take them off, fit that on here. You want to get me a 3 quarter inch or 19 millimeter on a socket? Yeah, either or. And that's it. That um, ratchet wrench. Because I'm gonna wanna. I'm not gonna wanna put this in with an impact. That's it. Want to grab me a rag too? Some residual oil down here. I'll go clean that up with it. Okay, if you're not familiar with a banjo fitting, the way they work is the oil is coming through the hose into this round open area. And when this is installed properly, the oil will then go into the center of this bolt and come out. It's a drilled and cross-cut bolt. And that's how it gets into the cylinder. So what you do is you need to seal both ends of that. So one of your seals goes on first, then your banjo goes across, and then the other goes on. And then this screws in to your adapter on the back of your cylinder. You want to make sure you get it started and don't cross thread it. So what I'll do is I'll just put the socket on there and I'll actually turn it by hand until I make contact with both my gaskets before I tighten it up with the ratchet. Okay, now I'm on there. I know I'm not cross threaded. Now I'll snug it up. This doesn't have to be that tight. These, the rubber washers actually do the sealing. So you just want to apply a normal amount of force. You can always tighten it more if it leaks a little bit. But most of the time, if you just get her good and snug, you won't have any leaks. At this point, I want to clean out the oil in here real good because if you do get a leak, you don't want to mistake it for residual oil that had been laying down there during installation. So I'm going to put the rag in there and just move it around. Get any oil off the base plate. Okay, now the shark's going to go. Up top and tighten our four bolts that hold the overhead on. These have been 
put on the lock washers and we want to make these good and snug because again, this is going to get some vibration if it's been operated. This is something, now I'm not going to mention it, but you know, a year down the road, you might want to just take some wrenches and go over that bolt on this lip just to make sure none of them work loose. It would not be uncommon that something may have worked loose. show you the trouble we had when we fed the hose down through why it ended up stopping we had to pick the carriage up is because there's another break in our guide you need to get a good view of this I don't get this cable out of the way you can see here's the guide then the other part is up here what happened is the hose came down of course instead of going in it popped on the outside so we had to raise this up so we could finish guide it down through to get it hooked up to the bottom of the cylinder now what we'll do is have to lower this back down, and then we'll continue. We're going to take a little break. Okay, to proceed on with the lift, we're going to finish running our second cable. The shark's going to be doing that now. He beats it through, and he's high enough to break down, and then he puts the cable in, so that you don't want to cross the cables or wrap them around the hose. There's going to be three things running across the top, two cables and a hose, and they all have to be in a direct path without being looped around each other. And that's a little tricky unless you look back and look at it. Now I'm going to go up and catch the cable when it comes through. This one's going to come through the front here. Are you there yet? Yep, I'm up there. Okay. up here. I don't know, can you see this? Maybe come around the other side, but right here there's a notch where the sheave has been cut off. Because the sheave is so close to the top of the post, without having that cut out, there'd be no way for me to get my cable up on there. So I got to line that cut out with the top, and now I'm able to get the cable around it. Oh, oh, wait a minute, you're, you're off your pulley down there. on the bottom has that notch out so that you can get it on without taking the sheave off the fin. Tight up top. And now we want to hook up our cables. If you follow the path of the cable, 
When it comes down, it's going to come straight down. You've got two options here. You have a hole up front and a hole in the back. If you go to the hole in the front, then it's going to put the cable at an angle. So you want to go to the hole closest to the back of the column. And in this instance, we're going to put the washer on first. Then the first nut. Then your second nut. The way the cables work, it's a push me, pull me. This cable starts in this carriage, goes down around the sheave, goes up, goes across the top, and comes down to the top of that carriage. So if you can imagine this, when this carriage is being picked up by the hydraulic cylinder, it's pulling on this cable, which at the same time is pulling up on this carriage also. Now granted, the cylinders are doing the lifting, but the cables are equalizing it. So then you have the reverse over here. You have this carriage, when it's going up, it's coming over the top and it's pulling up on this carriage. So once you get these adjusted right, we call it setting the timing. Both carriages will be moving simultaneously. They'll be engaging in the locks at the same time. And that's what the cables do, they're equalizer cables. They're not supporting the lift, or the vehicle, or the carriages. That's all done by the hydraulics. So in theory, if your vehicle is on here perfectly balanced, then cables wouldn't even be doing anything. Because the balance of the cable, or the balance of the vehicle, would keep the carriages going up evenly. But this is what solidifies the fact that they're gonna go up evenly. Now these are gonna need adjusted down the road. And we'll talk about maintenance later on. Okay? Now, let me show you a little trick here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this cable. This is the easiest one to adjust, not this one. So I'm going to actually back this one off until it's just one full, well, what I call it flush nutted. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take as much slack out of this cable as I can, because I can do this all by hand, then we'll jam this one, then when we get to running our lifts, all our adjustments are going to be made right here. Okay. Okay, and then in the future, they can continue to make adjustments. And it's going to take enough adjustment that we're going to be able to put our jam nut back on. So I'm just going to wind these up and get as much out of this. Like, uh, power you get to the advantage. We run a clear tank so you can see the oil level. So we're going to pre-fill this up before we mount it. It'll make it easier to fill up when it's not up in the air. So you want to
You know what we use is premium AW32 hydraulic oil. Get some water off of there. From, uh, the day they brought this in, it was pouring down raining. Keep that water from getting into our power unit. might ask, well, why do we use a 32 weight? Well, we use this exclusively in all our lifts, but it's really advantageous in our four post lift, because in a cold climate where a lot of times our four posts are being stored inside a cold garage, it helps the hydraulics keep moving a little faster than a thicker oil would. A thicker oil would have a tendency to slow the lift down. If you are in a real hot climate like Florida, Texas. If you wanted to, you could step up to a 46 weight hydraulic oil, AW46. Then the oil would always stay thin enough for your lift to go up and down because you'd have very few cold days that would affect the oil. Okay, how are we? Okay, I see it now. Yeah. We're not at half yet. enough to get started. Okay, it won't go anywhere. Now, yeah. let me get this power slot in. Just pick up a little bit. There we go.
last one. Now the alignment holes we use, we went into the slots. The power unit has holes and then it has slots. The, the two furthest slots and then we use the two furthest sets of holes. And those are the ones that line up. There is another set of holes in here. And the ones that work are the top and the bottom and the top and bottom slots. Okay, we can tighten that up. When you put this together, you have your O-ring gasket, which goes against your power unit boss. Now this fitting, both ends will screw into there. But only one's correct. So you gotta make sure you put the right end in. And the easiest way to tell is the one end is countersunk. The other end is not countersunk. The non-countersunk end goes into the power unit. And you just snug that against the opening. You don't have to go crazy tight. The countersunk in then fits this 90. You can see the male matches up to the female, and that's what actually does your ceiling. Okay. We're going to have to relocate the pressure port. This power unit has two locations. They opened up the one on the left in order our hose would not squeeze behind the motor. So we're going to have to move it over here to the right. And it's a simple switch. If you need to come around here. You see this plug here, this steel plug? That's the same port as we had on the other side. We take that plug out. This can go in here so we can hook up to our hose. And then we'll take this plug and put it over on the other side where the red plug was. So what I'm gonna need is an Allen wrench, metric Allen wrench to fit there. There's an assortment up there on the workbench. This one, six millimeter. Now he takes this out, show him the O ring seal on that. Whenever you have the boss ports, there has to be an O-ring against this to seal it. Now he's going to bring that over to this side. And actually all our Bucher power units that we use on all our Advantage lifts, they both have two ports, so you can always pick the port that suits, suits you the best. Okay, you good? Mm -hmm. Okay, now we'll try this over again. Put this over on this side. I just assumed that they had the plastic plug on that side. That's the side they want us to hook the hose to, but there's no way it'll fit over there. Okay, same thing. Just snug it up. 
You can put the adapter in. Again, we did the right way. We used the countersunk end out. Hook up to our 90, which because that 90 is a swivel, we can choose any location we want. against the power unit. Keep it snugged in there. Yeah. JIC fittings. You just want to go until it stops, stops. And give it a little bit more. I'm gonna hold it. Stop. Give it a little bit more. Okay, you don't want to over tighten these because you could possibly crack the taper. So what we'll do is we'll pressure test this and most likely we'll have no leaks. If for some reason we do, then we can tighten them a little bit more. Okay, now that the char is putting our brackets on to run our safety release cable, and we'll go over what he did there. I'm gonna start getting the arm drain installed. A good practice, in fact, the proper practice would be to lubricate where the arm pivots. Been, the reason for this is because over the years I've been in so many garages where the mechanic has to kick and kick on his arm to get him underneath the car and the fix for it would be just to grease the pins and then they fly in and out with no effort at all plus if they're not greased and you won't find this in the instructions after a while even though it's only moving a quarter of a turn It'll eat away at the pin and at the carriage, causing your arms to sag. And this lift will last a long time, but once your arm starts sagging and you don't feel safe underneath it, you're gonna to to probably either wanna fix it or get a new lift. So a little bit of grease, and you will probably never have any wear at all on the pins. I know this I put in 20, 25 years ago where I've greased the pins, and I honestly don't know if the people even re-greased them, but when we went to move them, the pins came out, and there was no wear. So do yourself a favor, make this, take this step, and grease all the pivot points. I'll get my helper with all the muscles to pick up the arms and put them in there for me. Meanwhile, I'll get the pins and grease them. Now what you're going to notice is there's two different length arms. Even though they're both these stage arms, there's a shorter arm and a longer arm. The simple fact of the matter is the shorter arm goes to the front, the longer arm goes to the rear, and that's so trucks, which have long wheelbases, the long arm can reach back and get that. That looks like that's a shorter arm. So you can go ahead and put that right in the front. This, this pin, some grease on it. Okay, well, let's just get another one. We'll work that in then. What we don't want to do is hit on that arm with a hammer because you'll mushroom the end of the pin and then it's not going to go. What it may take is the lock holes are engaged 
It may just be a matter of picking up on this so that the lock pole will allow the pin to sever itself. These are the brackets for running the safety release cable and what this cable does when you pull the cable on that side it opens this side also so it'll end up hooking to here going around this pulley going up over that pulley across the top of the lift down this side and it hooks to this one which is the one that triggers the operation Okay, so now that cable, it's a sheath cable, and this is what it looks like. It's like about an eighth inch cable with a plastic coating. If I could just find the end, there it is. Now let me show you something over here. The instructions don't show this bracket like this. I'm going to eventually say the instructions are wrong because if you take this bracket and bring that one down here like it shows, this one does not work up there. So. Get a good look at what this is like, because this is going to work for you. Is it still what, by you? Yeah. And you'll, when you if you install your own lift, you're going to have to adjust, adjust them also. Now we got the safety release cable ran. It's pretty important that you're on all the pulleys, top, well, both the ones on the top and this one on the bottom here, where it rolls around. So when you pull up on the cable on the control side, it actually opens up this side also. Nothing will open now because we have it on the locks. But we're gonna final adjust this once we get it running to make sure they're open it all the way. So the next step is uh, plug it in and start to run. Okay, now the other one will start coming up. Due to path of least resistance, this is a shorter mode, it's a tiny bit long first. So they'll both be. off the locks, I should be able to open up. How's that one look over there as far as opening? Char? Hit it again. Good. We're coming out past the column. Should be. Go. No, we, we need to adjust it. Okay, let me, you work, let me see. We want to make sure both sides are open enough, far enough that they don't catch. Yeah, then if it's not open. No, see, it's, it's, I would like it to come out and meets to there so it's out past. So that adjustment is done over here where we were at. So where's that nut driver? Get 
get some out of it. There you go. That's good. I don't want to go too much. I want to make sure it engages. Okay. Now. Or to the locks. Watch your hand. I'm gonna want to make sure that as it goes down, it engages too. Lock. Now we're just all the way back in where it was. So okay, because if we get it too tight, we could possibly hold it open. But now we go. Okay, the timing is off. Uh, cables. So I'm going to open it up and lower it down. This will work some of the air out of the cylinder, so I'm going to have to go all the way to the bottom. I'll tell you what, LeShaw, while I'm doing this, you want to take the torque wrench and torque all the anchors. Now, remember when we used the impact gun, all we did was use to snug them up. The final setting would be 100 foot pounds of torque, and we'll do that with a torque wrench. Then I'd recommend, probably after a few months of using it, you check your torque. The retorque will be 70, 70 foot pounds. You don't go back to 100. 100 just the initial setting of the anchors. After that, 70 is sufficient. Nice, even, steady pull on it to get the torque. And so it, this is gonna, this is a quick type torque wrench. When it hits the hundred, it'll click. Now we're on the locks. I just sprayed the pin. Between the pin, and all I do is work it back and forth to get the get it where it helps the most. Okay, Lashar, if you work that release handle there, I'm gonna spray this. Keep working it. There you go. Tony looser. Now I'm going to hit this one. <coughs> let me, uh, let me, uh, what I want to do is I, I go in here and then I just bump the pin back and forth. Yeah, I can show it already. There's just no drag. Now I'll go up top and I'll get the two rollers up top. Sure. Yes. I hate to get this on you. You want to go over there and work that handle again? But I'm going to spray this and I know it's going to hit you in the forehead. And that'll work it in. And that'll be no one. Go ahead. Again, this won't show this in the instructions, but there's sliders inside here. If you get up here closer, you can get a look at them. They're the white nylon sliders. They slide in the corners. They last nearly forever. But again, because they're nylon, and this is steel, with weight on it, there's going to cause friction. So I'm, that's why I got this paintbrush. I like to put some lubricant in the corner for them sliders run. You don't have to do the whole length. I just usually do about eight, ten inches. 
And there's eight sliders on each carriage. There's four at the top and four at the bottom. I actually had a customer who had a lift and it worked great until he put his heavy truck on it and because of the extra pressure on the sliders it would want to stick coming down and not release nice and smooth and I simply went back and greased up his sliders and uh, solved the problem. I'm a real believer in making the lift work as smooth and efficient as possible. The instructions don't always give you everything you need to do that, but grease is the big Keep things moved and a little bit of TLC that's with the last long, long time. Okay, now what I'll do is I'll run the top sliders up through this and then I'll grease the bottom, so then the bottom sliders will catch that. place to catch the bottom sliders. And the sliders as it goes up and down will spread this grease where it needs to be. Basically what I'm doing is get right in the corners. This is Mobile SCH 1500, SHC 1500 grease. It's a very good 100% synthetic grease. I'm not saying you have to have this, but if you can find some and use it, it'll definitely hold, hold in there for you. This is the grease we use in all our commercial in-ground lifts to grease up the bearings recommended by the commercial lift manufacturers.
Okay. Now we're going to adjust the cables. We're going to get it at a nice height and we can get to our bolt. go up a little higher because it's still out of the way. Okay, we're on the same lock. See the looseness of the cables? We need to take that out. We need to fix that. We need to adjust that by this one that we left loose here. So let's get a ladder. Okay, I'm going to get the small pair of ice grips. Tied up on this, I'm going to notice this cable's going to keep getting snugger and snugger. starting to feel pretty snug. Now I'm going to come over here and match it. This one's still loose. This one will get tightened up when I tighten up the top. I'm going to run her up and see what the time is. Okay, first second. It's much closer. So the fact that this one's first, it's up higher. And by tightening up on this one, we're actually trying to draw this down and draw that one up. So we're going to adjust just this one. Each time we adjust it, we put the face so we'll try that. Okay, you hear the talking? It's like dead on. I can stand here and it sounds like there's just one. Go ahead and run it all the way to the top. So while it's going down, let's review some things. Number one, we want to grease on all our pins. So all our pins, look how easy that moves. If that wasn't greased, it wouldn't move that easy. We want to grease inside the columns so that it picks it up on the sliders so that things work smooth. We want to spray any pivot points that are metal to metal, especially the ones that work with the locks so that when you push down that lock handle it, it doesn't take much of an effort. You should almost be able to open this lock with one finger when, when you know it's working right. Our timing is good. We're clicking evenly. That means our locks are hitting evenly. So at this point now we can throw our jam nuts on here and jam them tight. All the anchors torqued up good to 100 foot pounds. Yeah, they look good. They're not rolling roll up far. Now, when you retorque them, again, it's just 70. It's not uncommon that even on a good floor, that you need to um, don't, don't pull retorque. Every lift I've ever put in personally for myself has uh, has taken a little bit of retorque. It's just something you want to do. Eventually, it'll stop, but everything settles a little. Uh, you want to just check all the nuts and bolts. 
occasion, make sure nothing's coming loose. These are the pads I was talking about. This hard neoprene is very good on pinch points. They don't cut it, so if you have a car that has pinch points or a shallow frame, this is what you want to leave on. But if you're going to pick up a truck, these pull off normally very easy. There. They're just pinned in there. Now you have a big cupped out area that if you have a truck, you can put your frame right in here so it doesn't want to slide on you. And then when you want these back in, they just pop back in. That's why we say it's almost the best of both worlds. You got a car adapter and a truck adapter. Then for your running boards or high frames, you have your stack adapters. You simply set in there, there's a notched out area to keep it from spinning. Set your adapter in, and then it has fine adjustment on it. You got about three inches on it. If you need a little bit more, would you put it on the back of the truck? You have more. Three stage doors. Both front and rear. And that gives you a good reach. So when you have a truck that's long, you grab it far apart. Like if you have a 22 foot truck like that one sitting outside, you don't want to have your arms in here. You want to have them out as far as possible for a good, good stable picking point. Now, this wire's hanging down here. You probably say, well, what's that for? Well, this is our overhead switch. This we got to run down here and mount into the power unit. So that's all we have left to do except put the covers on. Um, so I'll work at this while well, he's putting the covers on and and we'll show how that overhead switch works. If you uh, look at the thickness of the channel here, you don't hear no dinging when you hit the frame. You look at the weight of the arms are made. Now we consider this our residential lift, but I think it's above and beyond what most residential lifts are. I also take this time to thank you for watching. Hope you can learn something from it. We're not professional video takers, so if there was any bloopers, enjoy them too. Like if I called somebody by the wrong name. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, this is a control wire. One's in, one's out. So this control wire is going to break. One of these. So I can, if I can get my screwdriver in there. That's out. Okay, I think I'll get up there and run this down. Who am I going to go in at? Yeah, you want to go up there and take some zip ties up with you.
I think if you just come, you know this hole over here that we didn't put a bolt in? Yeah. If you can feed down through that. Shank there. Okay. Oh, axle. Okay, now we've finished wiring our overhead switch in. The overhead switch is the unit up there, controlled by the bar. Now when you open that up and look at it, there's going to be four connectors up there. There's going to be two on the outside and two on the inside. One's normally open, one's normally closed. You're going to want to connect to the normally closed ones, which are going to be the two center ones, with your control wire, which you get with the lift. So then we follow it down the back, tied it off, and went into the control box. Now what I did inside the control box, I basically removed this wire right here. The one wire from the switch that went up and pigtailed into this other wire at the top of the contactor. Basically this wire jumped from there to there. I removed it. So now when the power, this is one of your power legs, is turned on, that power has to go up through the blue wire, through the switch, down to the red wire, to the push button. So when you push it, now it lets power through to the coil, which then closes the contact and allows the lift to run. So let's go turn the breaker back on and make sure it all works. Okay, again, you push the button, we got power, it should run. And that's how it's supposed to work. So now we're just going to put all this stuff back inside the power unit, put our cover on here, and this lift, this lift's ready to go to work. Okay, I'll turn that breaker off again before I try put everything back inside. Okay, I think take this time to thank you again for watching the video. I hope it helped to make a decision on what lift to get. Um, we pretty much had a chance to clean out the area, get our tools put away to make room for the lift to pick up its first vehicle. The first vehicle I'm going to pick up is my personal um, 2010 Dodge Ram 2500, four-door, eight-foot bed with a common diesel. Uh, roughly, it weighs about 7,600 pounds with me in it. But before we do that, I'd like to make a quick review of important details that I don't want you to forget during the installation. Number one is greasing your armpits. When you grease your armpits, that's how easy your arms will move. Okay, if you don't, you're going to fight it to get them in. They're going to drag and you're going to have wear. Uh, number two, greasing the corners where the slider blocks work. Because they're a tight fit. Actually, on this one over here, we can see where the manufacturer actually shims the slider blocks in order to make a tight fit. You see a little steel tab there. And what that does is that gives you a tight fit so you don't have rock in your carriage. That's a commercial application. A lot of the commercial lifts out there, that's what they do. They shim fit them for a good, tight, long-lasting fit of your sliders. Third place to lubricate is all the pulleys that your safety release cable connect to. There's three of them. One back on the idler side and two overhead. And they're controlled by this. And also the pin that the locks pivot on. That's all metal to metal. Whatever spray lubricant you have. Uh, I used um, WD-40, you can use silicone spray, just whatever you have in life, anything helps. Now if you look, I can take my one finger and open up both locks. We've had a lot of calls where people install these where they say it's so hard to open this that they actually break the cable or pulls loose from the clamps. So if you do an installation and you can't open that with one finger, there's probably something wrong. Um, then the overhead switch was wired in. We showed you that earlier. So those are the important facts. You want these working well. You want everything loose and free. Now, I guess we'll bring a truck in and pick her up. Oh, one more thing, sorry. The covers, if you look at both covers are the same. One end has a cap, one end's open. The open end has to go up 
If you put the cap end on, what it's going to do is going to drag against your cable. And that's going to make it harder to, to pull. So when you put it on, have the open end up so nothing's hitting this. Have the cap end pointing down. And that's both sides. Okay, I'm going to throw this cover back on and then we'll go get a truck. Okay, what I did is I got out while I could still get out of the door, pretty easy. Um, there are bumpers down here that are to protect the doors. And what I'll do is I'll roll this into the position I want to pick this up. I'm roughly going to stop at the front tire about seven feet in front of the center line of the lift. actually a good starting point there. There I actually could have with this long truck drove past the column and got out of my door easily. Okay, what we'll do is I'll set this up, I'll adjust it, and then we'll give some final measurements to where we want to be. Now, what's nice about the three-stage arms is they reach very far back to catch the frame. Because it's a truck, I'm going to remove these pads so that I get a good grip. I'm going to use a tall truck adapter because I want to catch the frame before it hits my running boards. And then I'll screw this up all the way. Remember how we said earlier how you can remove these pads if you're picking the truck up by the frame? Now because my frame on this truck is the same plane, I'm going to use the same set of adapters. So what I did is I took my two small adapters, stacked them, and that will give me my equivalent to my one tall adapter. Okay, there's a little bit of a interference in the frame at this point, so I'm just going to go back a little bit, so that I miss that and get a nice, nice grab on the frame. Now we're going to set up the other side. Okay, now that I've made contact, I'm going to go around and verify that I'm still where I want my arms to be. 
Because with the automatic arm locks now, they're going to stay. Looking good so far. Yep, looking real good. Now I'm going to raise it up until the tires are a couple inches off the ground. And then we're going to do the shake. See how easily that picked that up? Now at this point, now this is an ALI, actually, um, inspector's training for what the, how to test. If you're not sure, this is where you shake the truck or vehicle. What you want to do is if it's going to come off, this is where you want it to come off. I shake the back and I shake the front. And if you look, there's no lifting off the pads. It's pretty balanced on there. If I were to be able to put little scales on each one of those four pads, the weight distribution would be pretty even. And that's the goal. That's the safe way to pick up a vehicle. Now I have no problem with raising this vehicle all the way up and getting underneath. So let's take her up. You'll hear the locks click it is as I'm going up. Now we originally had them set that the timing was even, but because the weight of the truck is a little different on left, left to right, it's not uncommon to have the locks separate a little bit. That's very normal. In fact, it's nice that you hear that separation because it lets you know both locks are engaging. Okay. Okay, we're to the point where we're about ready to hit the overhead switch. So I'm going to run this up. It's my truck. If it damages the roof, it's my fault. I put the lift in. The switch should shut off the power. And then it would not damage the lift or the roof. Okay, there it is. The top of the roof of the truck hit this overhead safety switch. The power unit is dead. It can't go up any further. So I can't damage the roof. I can't damage the lift. This is all the higher this truck's going to go up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower it down onto the lock. And this is where you'd want to work on your vehicle. Now, Unique, if you want to get underneath here, you can show how taking out these uh, rubber pads give you a good grab on your frame. See how you have a lip there? Now if that were being picked up by a pinch point on a car, you'd put the rubber pads back in and then that would grab that pinch point. And up here is where I had to move it back a little bit because I was going to be on this bracket here. So I wanted to be in front of it. So that's why I rolled it back that few inches to miss this cross beam. If this is a truck that you're going to pick up constantly, at this point I would probably mark my floor and write Dodge Truck on the floor. And I'd stop it at that point. So you wouldn't have to roll it back and forth. Okay, as a safety issue, if you're going to be like, we know it's stable now, okay? We shook it. But let's say I'm going to take this rear end out of here and put a new rear end in. You've just messed up the center of gravity. What would be behoove you for safety is to get a jack stand like this. It's an adjustable screw up jack stand. You can get it at any, any uh, auto parts store. Any, anybody sells supplies at um, Harbor Freight, just anybody. Uh, I found this one used. 
Okay, this one's not going to go all the way, so I'm going to actually have to put a block of wood in there. Uh, I don't have a block of wood, but or lower it down. But what I want to do is put this underneath, tighten it up, and what that does, do you see that rock in the truck a little bit? If you're working underneath it, that stops all that. Or if I was going to pull the tranny out of this and take weight off the front, that would transfer weight to the rear, that would support it. When you get a long vehicle like this, I always use these extended jack stands to help support the front and the back. So if you have, a, say, a 3500 series, dual wheels in the back, your center of gravity is going to be a little different. It won't be much different, but it'll still pick it up with no effort at all. And if it picks up a truck like this, of course, with the low pad heights we had, once you move your adapters, any, any car you're working on, any of your, you know, your classics, or um, even if you're into the tuner cars that are really low to the ground, the pad height is extremely low here. So it helps you get you underneath those, I call them beer can pushers, where they're slammed so close to the ground. Now granted, if they're that low, you may need to pick up one to get underneath, but for the most part, if it's driven on the street, you can probably get these pads underneath it at the low height. Okay, earlier in the video, we showed the lift going up and down without weight on it and how slow it went down. And I explained that that's because there's orifices that restrict the speed of the lift. Well, now that we have a 7,800 pound, 7,600 pound vehicle on, I wanted to show you just how quickly it goes down and why we need those orifices in. That's probably about as fast as you want to be able to go down safely. But what it will cause is when there's no weight on it, the lift's going to go down slow. But that's very normal and it's, it's designed that way for safety. Okay. Okay. Earlier in the video, we talked about positioning the lift in the garage so you get the most use out of the space you have. Well, here's a good example. What I'm going to do is actually measure this truck front to back. Um, if I recall, it's close to 22 feet. Let me make sure that that's correct. Yeah, to the tip of my ball, to the front bumper, this truck is 22 feet long. So if you're working in limited space, like 25 feet, you don't have a lot of room for air. So if you want to be able to get this truck in and pick it up on your lift and be able to close your door, you're going to have to position it properly. So what I'm going to do, we talked about staying a minimum of 13 feet from the garage door with this lift. So I'm going by the center line of the lift. Okay, I'm on the center line of the lift. If you need, you want to come back here. 13 feet is right there. Which, if you look at the ball, probably if you remove the hitch, you'd be just inside your door. And remember, I had to move this back a little bit. It's not like I can move it in further or else then I won't be in a place where I can pick it up safely because of our brakes connecting the frame. So we're 13 feet from the center line to the back of this truck. Now granted, this is a long truck, so everything else you do is gonna be a little bit shorter. So if it's 13 feet to the back, being it's 22 feet long, that's nine feet to the front, which is right here, which is the front bumper of this truck. In a 24 foot garage, if you stay nine or 11 foot from the nearest obstruction, which would be your wall 11 and 13, that would give you a two foot workspace in front of the truck. Which is right about here. Now granted, this is a 40 foot deep garage, so we had plenty of room to play. And granted, most of the vehicles that are going on this are gonna be a lot shorter, so this vehicle 
Um, I would say on most cars, you're going to be maybe about six feet in front of the center line. Which that's all the way back here. So then you're going to have more like four foot of working space and more room in the back. But you got to put your lift in based on your worst case scenario. So if you want to pick up a truck like, a truck like this in a 24 foot day, you got to make sure you position it right. And we went over that, like I said, a little bit in the video, but this is, this is proof here that you need to stay at least 13 feet from your garage door to get a truck this long inside.